we're good to go. Swan, should we start? Yes, yes, yeah. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for joining us today. And we would like to wish everyone a very happy Independence Day on behalf of the entire team at Internet Freedom Foundation. 15th August is a pretty special day for us here at IFF because it's not just India's Independence Day, it is also our organizational birthday. On this day, four years ago, IFF was established by volunteers who came together during the net neutrality movement, and we've come a long way since then, largely thanks to the support of technologists, lawyers, and ordinary internet users. And on this special occasion, we could not think of anyone better than Professor Devayan Gupta to speak about the perilous promise of technology in a digital India. Dr. Gupta is currently an assistant professor of computer science at Ashoka University, and he is also a visiting professor and research affiliate at MIT. His primary areas of interest include secure computing, cryptography, and privacy. He holds both positions at a number of startups, and he also advises companies and individuals about cybersecurity risks. Today, Professor Gupta will talk to us about how encryption technologies, which are often mischaracterized as a tool used by criminals, can actually help us defend and expand human freedom. Today's talk will also provide a broader picture about how technological advancement and the internet's ad-driven revenue model has led to pervasive surveillance and data collection by both private and government actors. Such constant intrusive surveillance by both Big Brother and Big Tech poses a massive threat to individual privacy, and Professor Gupta will discuss some legal, technical, and civic measures we can take to ensure stable and long decisions. I, for one, am very excited for the lecture. So without further ado, Professor Gupta to take the floor. Thank you, Devdatta. It's a pleasure. Um, I, I'm very glad we're doing this on the 15th of August. It's uh, somehow very fitting. So let me just get started. Uh, beyond anything else, the, the first slide, the, the background, I think I, I was thinking a lot about, oh, I'm going to talk about freedom, but I think some of it just has to do with me being cooped up in this house for a very long time. So, you know, forgive me for that. Um, but at least you can see a beautiful vista in front of you. And when I was thinking about what to say in this lecture, I, I was, I, I had a lot of titles I went through. I wanted to talk about encryption and I wanted to talk about privacy and I wanted to talk about surveillance capitalism, you know, what Zuboff talks about, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then I realized what I really wanted to talk about was fear, right? All of these other stuff, they are intermediaries. They are tools that are used in various ways uh, to control us. And what we want to talk about is where our minds can be without fear. And me being a Bengali, of course, it was easy to quote to God. So, I want to start off by uh, having the very important and very standard set of bullet point slides that everyone else has. I want to assure you that this is the, I think it's one of only two slides in this entire deck with bullet points, but uh, it's appropriate that I go through some of the basic ideas that I'm going to mention. First of all, I'm going to give you a short, uh, a, a couple of short snippets of history to emphasize why encryption and associated privacy related technologies are important. Uh, then I'm going to try and help you uh, understand why I think it's incredibly important, especially for lawyers and uh, civic society, uh, to understand that you can't make a law against this stuff. You can't solve this by legislating it away. This is something that requires a deeper solution. And I'm going to try and go through that uh, I, I have a couple of other slides talking about the importance of privacy just in our daily lives, just outside of, you know, government snooping in and other stuff, just sort of how it can be used by other evil agents, so to speak. Then I'm going to go into a topic that's really important to me, uh, AI authoritarianism. I, I, I call it uh, sort of a corollary of uh, the ROT theory, which is robot overlord theory. Um, and I just made that up, no, but uh, I'm going to look into how large tech organizations and nation states are using the same kind of 
uh, scaling and pervasive reach uh, that was provided by computation to all of these various other nice things that we're doing. Um, but they're using it for really bad purposes, especially tyranny. And we're going to explicitly discuss some of the things China is doing in that area. And we'll also discuss a couple of other countries. Then I'm going to try and put forth some of my solutions. And I here, here's what I want to really emphasize. These are going to be technological solutions because I'm a tech guy, right? Uh, but I want to make it very clear just that having just tech solutions is by no means uh, sufficient. We're going to need a lot more in order to actually solve this problem. And I hope to give you a big picture idea of what that problem is that we're trying to solve and what are the rights we should even be looking for. Because just as I said when I went slightly earlier when I was talking about uh, scaling and how the problem itself has changed, etc., uh, where it, it's not going to be enough to think about the rights and responsibilities the way we did 20, 30, 40 years ago, let alone a few centuries ago. Uh, so I'm going to offer some solutions and hopefully uh, you, all of you listening in on the call can offer me some more. Okay, so let's start off with a little bit of history. Um, I'm gonna talk about the story of a country and a company. Now this company based out of this country uh, had developed uh, a new cellular technology as they call it. It's a completely new generation of technology. Um, it allows you to bring the power of telephony and the internet uh, into your pocket and you can go to places where you never went before and you can have this ability to connect to people across the world it's amazing except there's a problem right the problem is that people are slightly suspicious because they don't like this country very much it's done some bad stuff in the past um when it comes to techn techno technological infiltration shall we say and the fear is that uh this country will force this company to somehow embed evil stuff in the technology, in the standards that it's espousing. And then these standards will spread all across the world and it will give this country unprecedented access to all of our communications. Um, now I have been slightly evil and I may have misled some of you into thinking that I was talking about Huawei and China. Of course I'm not, I'm talking about the US and at and um, I'm happy to, or sad to inform you that this is actually happening. So I want to start today by talking about something called A51 and A52. Feel free to Google those as we go along. Um, in 1987, uh, AT&T, a couple of other smaller companies in the US, they basically came up with a modern conception of the cell phone. And uh, throughout the 1980s, there was a lot of development in this area. And they got quite worried. They were thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to send all this information over the airwaves and, you know, people can listen in on that. And that's not such a good thing, is it? So uh, they came up with a rudimentary kind of encryption called A51, uh, and they put it on their cellular devices. Uh, the, they put it into the actual GSM standard itself. And they said, if you wanted to communicate, you could do so unencrypted or you could do so over this very nice A51 clever encryption thing. Turned out to be not so clever, but nevertheless. Now, uh, the US government via the NSA and blah, 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 all of these agencies, three letter agencies, um, they were quite worried about this. They thought that, hold on, we've invested so much money in signals intelligence over the years. Now, suddenly everyone's going to go online and they're going to use these cellular devices and we're not going to be able to listen in on them anymore. This is horrific. What are we, what are we going to do? And then some clever bozo clearly said, hey, we can just force them to not do it. We can, we can put in our own encryption. We can inject uh, flaws into it. And that is exactly what they did. So a couple of years after that, A52 came along in 1989. And A52 was an artificially weakened, exploited version of A51, uh, which, according to the US government, basically meant that they alone could listen in on all the communications while everyone else would use A52 and think they were safe. And that was what was used to export uh, cell phones into many regions across the world. Hint, hint, many of those regions ended up building most of the cell phones in the world, so that turned out to be a bad thing. 
Uh, but it took a long time for A5-2 to be removed, right? Um, A5-2 and aspects of A5-1 were broken well before the millennium, uh, the end of the millennium, and then, you know, A5-2 A5 was phased out over time, and now we have something else called A5-3, uh, based on uh, something called Kasumi. It was indirectly developed by the Mitsubishi Corporation, whatever. That's, we don't need to go into that. Um, but... Kasumi itself has some issues. Uh, Shamir and some other uh, cryptographers broke certain aspects of uh, A53 encryption back in 2010. So, you know, it's a whole cat and mouse game. But what I want to get across to you is the reason that people are afraid of China using Huawei to do bad things is because the US has done it before and it's continuing to do it. And I assure you that many, many countries across the world have done and are doing exactly this with the, with the companies based out of those countries. That's why people are afraid. Not because they think China is evil, but because everyone thinks that everyone else is like them. And it's kind of true, right? So I, I, I wanted to have that snippet of history just in the background as we talk about why encryption is important. Now, the second bit of historical background I want to give you is uh, slightly different because this was about one country wanting to spy in on other countries or citizens of others. The second kind of spying is sort of inward looking, right? Government saying, you know, hey, you know, you can't have encryption. What if you're a terrorist or a pedophile or something or some horrific creature, whatever. Um, and this is not a new idea, right? This goes back to medieval times. If you had a town if you were the feudal overlord of some tiny town or something and you wanted to fortify your township uh you needed to go and ask permission from the king or queen first and the reason reason was quite simple right because yes fortifying the town added to the value of it it meant that you could defend yourself against raiders certainly but it also meant that if you rebelled against the king or queen if you rebelled against the ruler they now had to expend significantly more effort to take your town back. So they needed to first trust you. You needed to get permission from the overlord uh, in order to fortify. And once you were trusted, then you could fortify and it was a way of sharing power as well, right? Now, let's bring the same idea into today's terms. The problem is quite simple. The government doesn't quite trust you because, hey, you could be a terrorist. So they're saying we we can't possibly go in and make sure we trust everybody so what we're going to do and this is obviously i'm not going to go into the obvious part of how this is ridiculous overreach yada 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 all of you know that but what they're saying is because we can't trust you we need to be able to look inside your devices right and that's why we need backdoors and encryption yada 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 um and this is obviously fantastically stupid, right? We can barely do encryption anyway. Many, many systems, I, I highly recommend this paper called The Most Dangerous Code in the World, um, where uh, five or six years ago, they, they looked into a lot of these implementations of encryption and found out they were trash, right? Um, we can barely do encryption. So, you know, why would we want to do a significantly harder and probably impossible way of encrypting things? One that introduces a new critical point to failure because then why would hackers ever hack into your devices? They would just target wherever the government is keeping its keys for all the devices and then, then they'd get access to everything, right? It's a critical single point of failure. Stupid. Um, it's, but nevertheless, governments across the world have been insisting on this over and over again. It's been since there since the 1990s, you know. You can look up clipper chip and all of that stuff. But it comes back every once in a while like a bad penny. And I think governments don't understand two very basic things. Number one, mathematics doesn't care about your laws, right? You, 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 can, you can't just say, oh, make a hole for me in mathematics, here's a signed word. Maths doesn't care about that. If there's a hole that the Indian government can use, well, guess what? So can the Chinese, so can the Americans, so can the Brazilians, so can anyone else. There's no way of making a specific call that only one country is able to use. The second issue is one of geographical assumptions, and this has to do with sort of long-term export control on software. So let me see if I can bring that idea through. Essentially, uh, a long time ago, 
what used to be the case is um, if you had a door with a lock on it, you, need, you didn't need to worry about making that lock secure against a determined opponent, right? Someone coming in with, you know, 20 soldiers or something, they could break down your door lock quite easily. The, the whole point of the door lock was to make it difficult for uh, an average burglar to get in and pick that lock without making too much noise. And there were economic things also preventing that sort of, if you were a locksmith who was capable of picking that lock, the social and legal repercussions of actually doing so uh, were too bad, too big and too bad. So you would rather live honestly as a locksmith than do this thing. And economically, if locksmiths weren't paid enough, more of them would probably do bad things and so on. So it, it's not just uh, a geographic assumption, it's also economics, Lot, lots of things played into it, played into it. But then what you did was you said, okay, maybe my lock is not enough to stop the Russian or Chinese or American armies. But I mean, that's what I pay my taxes for, right? Your, your taxes pay for the police to protect you from uh, armed robbers and stuff. And then it pays for the Indian army and other armies across the world, whichever country you're in, whatever, uh, to protect you from other huge sources of danger. Now, the problem is in today's world, none of that applies all of these geographic domes of protection your door lock and then your local police force and then your crpf national guard whatever and then you have your army all of those things collapse because guess what the russian government or the brazilian government or the japanese government they can directly attack your laptop once it's on the internet right so all of these different domes of protection have just collapsed and now when the indian government comes along and they say, we want a hole in your final dome of protection so that we can look in. Obviously, citizens are not going to be very enthused about it, right? And um, I'm going to talk about this paradox a bit more, but I just wanted to give you that sort of collapsing domes idea because I find it cool. Now on to my third point. Now that we have a basic idea of the history, I want to talk about the actual problem that I see facing us today. I do not think that the problem has anything to do with sort of specific things. I don't think the problem is Aadhaar. I don't think the problem is uh, lawful intercept and monitoring. By the way, when a law has the word uh, legal or lawful in it, you know it's bad. You know, you, you, th that's why they put it in there. You know, you're going to read the law and you're going to be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh my God, that can't possibly be legal, but that's why they put it. It's like, no, 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 it's, it says so in the, in the, in the name. It's, it's L-I-M, Lawful Intercept and Monitoring. It's legal. Um, so look it up. If you're an Indian, you ought to be quite worried about it. It's pretty bad. Um, but what I want to get into is like, none of that stuff actually matters because those are things I have full faith in everyone listening in right now and many, many others across this country and other countries in the world that when push comes to shove, you will defend yourselves. You will go to court and there is enough good people in the world that we will be able to stop all of these things one at a time when they become too dangerous. My worry is something else. My worry is that technology is going to scale too fast, too quickly for laws to keep up with them. And I want to illustrate that with one of my absolute favorite examples in this area, something called automatic license plate readers or number plate readers, ALPRs or ANPRs, depending on which country you're in. And you may have seen some of these, you know, you're, you're driving, 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 and you run a red light. Um, now, what you'll notice is that there's very often a camera at one of these lights, and it just sort of uh, takes a picture of you when you run the red light, and then you get a ticket, you know, two, three weeks later in your mail saying, hey, here's a photo of you doing this bad thing. So, you know, pay your fines. And it's, it's worked out quite well for most places, you know? Now, why can they take that photo? Why, why, why is that okay? And the answer to that is pretty simple, right? Because if you go back in time, it's sort of similar to if you have a policewoman or policeman standing by the street and they see your car go by, you're in public, you have no real expectation of privacy, yada, yada, yada. And they decide, you know, I. I'm just going to write down the number of this car. The guy driving it looked really iffy. And oh, there he goes. He ran a red light. I'm going to definitely underline that. And he's going to be in trouble uh, a week or two from now. So that's sort of the logic, you know, that policewoman or policeman taking down your number in public. So it's okay. 
And that's what these cameras are doing. They are simply an automated form of that exact act. So the legal ideologies, the legal ethics that allowed uh, the police person to take down your number are the same ones that are meant to allow this computational system to automatically do exactly the same thing. And they may have some optical character recognition in there, yada, 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 no big deal. What I want to emphasize is what happens next. What if there isn't just one camera? What if there are hundreds of thousands of cameras? Just think about this for a moment. If you have cameras at every crossing, I can now track your car wherever it goes. Now think about it this way. If I asked you, do the police need your number to write down, do the police need a warrant, I apologize, uh, to write down the, your, your car details as you go past? And you'd probably say no, right? What's the big deal? Someone just takes down your number. Now, what if I said, do you think the police need a warrant to put a GPS tracker on your car so they can track you everywhere you go? And most of you would probably say in most countries in the world, no, 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 that's a terrible idea. I, the, the police definitely need a warrant in order to do that. The problem is, because of scaling, the ability to do the first thing, take down your number with a single camera, now with scaling allows you the power to do the second thing, that is track your car wherever it goes. And of course, immediately, people began using it for bad reasons. Now, in many cases, one, one might... One of the funniest things I ever hear people say about this sort of surveillance stuff is, you know, what do you have to hide? And I always force them to finish that sentence, you know. What do I have to hide from whom? The problem is the government or law enforcement, they're not some sort of monolithic entity, right? They're made up of individuals. And many of those individuals, just on some bell curve, are going to be very bad people. And what that means is, if those individuals have access to my data without proper oversight or without me having a way to get back at them if they misuse that data, they're almost certainly going to do bad stuff with it. And it turns out that's exactly what people were doing. In the US, there have been myriad cases. Um, there was one particular thing in Minnesota, I believe, where someone tracked what the police were using this stuff for. And again, it's, it's, there's no warrant required, no expectation of privacy, yada, yada, yada. Germany's put in some stuff around it. Some US states have, but not everyone. Many other places across the world have no real protections against this sort of thing. And what were police using it for? Guess what? Most of them were using it for, it was mostly male policemen, males, uh, looking in on their girlfriends and ex-wives, trying to track where they went and all of that stuff. That was the biggest area of misuse. And it turns out that in, at least in a couple of the departments that were surveyed, something like 50% of the queries were just that, right? And of course, then on top of this, you have police incompetence. Look at your, your I, I welcome many of you to look into what happened uh, with the Boston uh, Police Department, where they accidentally posted all of these details online on a Xerox server. And then some people figured out they were being investigated when they weren't supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, just stupidity all along the chain. The problem, of course, again, is not the individual in incident. The problem that I want to highlight is that scale changes the problem itself, right? You can't rely on old laws, on your instincts to say this is legal because it should be legal and that is illegal because it should be illegal. Because it turns out you can take a legal thing, add scale to it, and then create an illegal thing. And I'm, I'm somewhat mixing up legal and ethical here. I'm sure many of the lawyers are quite angry at me for that. But you get what I'm saying. You can take a concept that was ethical and well understood and therefore enshrined in law, and you can tweak it with scale. And now you can create something that should not be enshrined in law, that most people agree is a problem. And this ALPR thing is just one example of that. That's what I'm afraid of. It's not these individual things. We, I, I, know, I trust you. You will fight those individual things. IFF and many other organizations across the world, you're up at it 24-7. You're going to do great stuff. I trust you. The problem is this. The problem is so many of our problems are scaling and changing in, 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 in ways that are very difficult to keep up with 
then we need to come up with a new paradigm. We need to come up with a new way of thinking about what rights we want and what kind of, what types or classes of defenses will prevent long-term uh, pervasive issues, not just in surveillance, but in other kinds of areas, some of which I'll touch upon next. Okay, I, I, I want you to sort of keep that umbrella problem in your head as we move along. Now, because of this changing nature of the problem, it turns out that structuring long term legislation is incredibly difficult. And this is something, you know, I've been talking about it up till now from the point of view of just sort of uh, nation states. But this is something that companies across the world have been taking advantage of for a long time. Right. And that's somewhat understandable because they can move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction in some sense, because stuff that's legal here isn't legal there, so on and so forth. And, you know, this this also helps privacy in other ways. We'll discuss that if we have time later. But how do governments go about structuring long term legislation in a world that is changing so very rapidly? So, for example, um, there are many areas in India and abroad where you have sort of these uh, legal notices about not having drones in a particular zone. And the idea behind that may be that, you know, some idea of, oh, I don't want people looking in on me somehow. But it turns out there are other ways of doing the same thing. Satellite imagery in some cases, there are other kinds of objects that are not really classified as drones formally, et cetera, et cetera. So how does one go about structuring long-term le legislation around this stuff? And my instinct, and I'm not a legal scholar, my instinct is what you cannot do is say that let's make drones illegal, let's make ALPRs illegal, let's make this illegal, let's make that illegal. What you need to do is come up with a concrete set of privacy requirements that are inherent to each individual and then let the companies work their way around that. And people are beginning to think about that sort of thing. When it comes to the internet, I strongly encourage many of you to look into something called Solid Pods. Uh, it's uh, Tim Berners-Lee's uh, latest project. He was sort of dismayed with what had become of the internet. Um, and it's his way of trying to give people back control. And I want many of you to think about this problem. I haven't solved this, but I do want you to start thinking about how can we structure long term legislation around this? And what are those individual rights that we want to enshrine to protect all of us in the long term? And hopefully in the Q&A session, some of you can give me some ideas about that. Now. When we're talking about those uh, privacy ideas that we want to protect, um, I, I want to make it quite personal. I want to talk about, you know, why do we need privacy? When, when, when do people go in for privacy, right? And obviously, you know, computers pervade everything, you know, romance, making friendships, e-commerce, banking, everything of that sort, right? And, uh, Whenever we do this sort of thing, many of us want to do it quietly. And this, this is something that was posted not too long ago on a university confessions web page uh, on Facebook, actually. And I mean, you can read it yourself, but it's, it's, the, the, this, it's kind of cute. It's completely unsafe, by the way, because the space of uh, username addresses is well known. It's a small directory few thousand people, it was obviously broken in a matter of minutes by other MIT people. So um, not really safe to roll out your own encryption is the moral of this slide. But the idea I want to put across is that your personal information is worth a lot to governments, to criminals, and to tech organizations. Right? Uh, I, I see the questions, by the way. I'll get to them in a moment. Now, it's, the problem is it's really hard to put a price on these things. Now, there are various people who've tried to do this in different kinds of ways, sort of, let's see how much profit uh, these large tech organizations make, and then we'll sort of reverse engineer that to find out how much your data is worth. Uh, another way which I like more is 
to actually see how much it's worth on the black market, right? Just go to the dark web and see how much this stuff is selling for. Um, and I have the prices up there. And it turns out, even for Indians, uh, the prices are pretty high. And the problem is that, uh, especially for medical data, this stuff is really, really, really bad because it ties into insurance systems and stuff like that. And we can talk a little bit about that later on. I, I have a hilarious story about how, when I was working with some people, no, okay, not really working, chatting with some people from the FBI, they told me about this ridiculous case where uh, there was a gas station in Massachusetts which was pretending to be a crutch manufacturer. And what they'd done is they'd stolen a bunch of medical records and they found all the people with knee problems and they were selling crutches to all of those people. Of course, none of these crutches existed. And because they were doing that for people with knee problems, the automated systems on the insurer side never flagged those. And they were just charging the insurance companies tons of money. And you see this happening with advertising agencies as well. You have fake apps that track your movement. And then they pretend to Google and other people that they've been serving you ads uh, and stuff like that. So uh it, it, it's it's a whole ball game and and everybody's cheating everybody now i'm not going to go too much into the criminal side of things um but i do want you to read the quotation on the side of the slide uh some of you will know who said this um i i am going to this is going to be only once of two times in this entire slide deck that i'm going to read out something on a slide i hate doing that um, but I do want to read out the second paragraph. We don't need you to type at all. We know where you are. We know where you've been. We can more or less know what you're thinking about. This was said by Eric Schmidt, the guy who really built Google in many ways. He was, he headed it all the way up to 2017. Um, in, Towards the end, it switched to alphabet or you know, whatever cover you want to put on it. Um, and he said this in 2010. He said this 10 years ago. So just think about, and, and he said this in public to The Atlantic. So I just want you to think about how completely ridiculous things are today in terms of how much Google knows about you. And given how much uh, information is worked on the dark web, how much Google can leverage the information they know about you for. And here's where something I, I, I found something kind of hilarious. You know, most of my friends, many people in India, when I tell them about privacy, I get it's sort of, oh, the NSA has been looking at my data. And they're not really mad that the NSA has been looking at their data. They're mad the NSA didn't hit like, you know, they're, they're, the, they're, there's, no, uh, there's no, no real concept of privacy there. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're so used to giving away stuff about ourselves in order to sort of show that, hey, I'm present, I'm someone, I'm on the internet, uh, in order to sort of create our presence, um, that these companies have sort of turned us into these data generators. I, I honestly believe the best way to prevent that, or at least put, put some controls around that, is to make people aware of how much their data is worth. Because if people know that, hey, you know, Google's giving me A, B, and C, or Facebook's giving me A, B, and C, or Microsoft, whatever, but they're making $3,000 a year off of that, the first thing people are gonna say is, hey, I, I want me some of that moolah. I, I, I want that money. I want, a, I, want, I want a stake in that. And so um, perhaps that might be a way around it. I don't know. But I, I think a very important first step is to start building these protections. All right, I'm going to quickly pause and try and answer a couple of the questions. Uh, personal use of encrypted communication. Um, the second question, I'm, I'm going to answer another question also about can authorities force giving up one's private keys, etc. Now, the, the issue is it depends on the country. In India, the problem is they can and they can't. Uh, they can in the sense that they can sort of get you for obstructing justice, and if you don't give, give them your keys and all of this other stuff, people have gotten into lots of legal trouble over it. And uh, 
laws like the UAPA are problematic anyway. They give the government a lot of power. Uh, I'm sure the legal scholars here will be able to answer that in a lot more detail. But uh, when it comes to actual encryptions and asking about whether VPNs or encryptions are safe, etc., they are in the sense that nobody is going to expend the effort to actually hack the encryption, all right? Nobody does that. What they're much likely to do, like the old XKCD cartoon, is to, they're going to put you under duress. They're going to put you in so much trouble that you're going to give them all the keys. And that's pretty standard. Um, the second part is, okay, I, I like the third question. It's about uh, language. You know, most of these conversations are happening in English. They used to, I think people are becoming more aware of that. Like I myself have a talk on similar issues, sort of educating people about privacy in a couple of days in Bengal. So people are branching out into vernacular languages right now. And I think it's a very, very important part of it. Though I do believe that there is a, a lot of people actually that I've seen who are doing stuff in vernacular languages, they're actually surprisingly careful about not posting too much garbage, right? Especially on Facebook and Twitter. Um, this, this is just personal experience. I don't know if that scales, but you know, it's 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 it's, it's something I've just noticed. Um, push towards smart cities, LPRs exactly. As 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 all of these technologies develop, not just the LPRs, as we start getting more into the Internet of Things or the Internet of Stings, as a very famous person has said, look it up. Um, I don't think it's going to be the end of privacy because all of us and all of you are going to keep fighting for it. But And, and also, frankly, the governments of the world aren't really competent enough to process all of that data, right? You know, the U.S. records a lot of phone calls and does a lot of stuff with it. They don't have the manpower or the capability to really do anything with it. So... Don't 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 give these people too much, uh, you know, too much value in terms of their competence either. Uh, look up, for example, you know, all of this X key score and all of the stuff the NSA did. Think about how many attacks they stopped. It when when they were asked about, about it, it, they said eighty four or something, and then they brought it down to a dozen. And eventually, they said they'd stopped one Somali taxi driver in LA from transferring eight thousand four hundred dollars to his brother in Somalia or something like that. Like. These are not the brightest crayons in the box. What they have is very large amounts of resources and some very clever people offering them very powerful technology. They themselves aren't always using it in a very useful or clever way. All right. Um, how can one assess the value of one's data? Like I said, super difficult problem. Best way to think about it is look at its value in the black market. Um, but I would hope that one day individuals value their data more than just its dollar value in the black market. I think it's really important. Now, given this entire background conversation, I, I, I want to bring back the thing I was talking about before, why governments want to spy on you. And I want to bring in the other side of the story a little bit, right? Uh, many of the actions of the government are not because they're evil, really. It's because they don't know how to deal with this new world. When they're talking about information localization, many of us are screaming at them, like, what do you, do you want to impose sovereign borders on the internet? Like, do you even have the hardware in India to impose localization of information? Like, how are you going to do that? Um, but what they're thinking is, okay, there was this case not too long ago where there's some sort of evil person happened to be a pedophile, evil person in India that had been organ that had been talking to some other evil people over Gmail in, in the US. And now we need to go to a US court to exfiltrate that data. And the US court says they won't allow our warrants because they're not satisfied with it. And then we can't get that data. Now everything's stuck, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this international flow of information because of jurisdictional issues is a huge problem. And um, the U.S. gets around that somewhat using the FBI's uh, field office, the legat offices, and they have all of these under-the-table things that are going on all the time. But various other governments don't have those advantages, and I can see why they want to solve those things. The problem is, what, I, what I'd like to rec 
compare it to a sort of uh, government saying that, hey, you know, I think roll down windows on airplanes are an immensely good idea. You know, people can open them up while the aircraft is taxiing and get a breath of fresh air. And every, you know, uh, aeronautical engineer just sort of tearing their hair out and saying, are you mad? You want to put roll down windows on aircraft? It's ridiculous. But I mean, they might be saying it for a good reason, but their solution as such is obviously going to be very, very destructive, right? If people start putting in back doors into encryption, for example. Okay, let, let's go with it since I took the segue. Let's say the Indian government puts a back door into encryption used by software produced in Indian companies. Well, are the British going to agree to use that software? They're going to say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I want to use this stuff with Indian backdoors. And they're going to have their own backdoors. And the U.S. is going to have its own backdoors. And everyone's going to have their own backdoors. And nobody is going to be willing to use software produced in any other country. Um, how will multinational companies do it? There's probably going to have to be some sort of UN-like body which does this, um, which turns it into a Herculean task in the original meaning of the word Herculean. Uh, that's, you know... Uh, the gods are out to get you, Herculean. And even after doing this, there's no guarantee that, you know, it's going to have any effect on criminals because, of course, the criminals are not going to use the software that has the backdoors in it. They're going to use software that doesn't have the backdoors in it, which already exists. So, all very stupid, but this is I don't want to always assign bad motivation to the governments. They're just... More often than malice, it is just ignorance and a bunch of, I don't want to be ageist here, but it's true that a lot of the people making these decisions are 50, 60, 70 years old. And a lot of those people, let's say in India, have not grown up with this stuff. They, 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 this is a new thing they have to learn. And some of them have gotten very competent at it. Unfortunately, in our case, many of our politicians have not. And we need to have a way of educating them. And I think anyone who's watched the antitrust hearings, the recent ones in the US or the ones before that, you, you, you should, you, it, it, those are a very good illustration of what I'm saying there. Okay. Now, given all of this stuff, I, I want to uh, bring up a very specific issue now that I've talked about, you know, countries installing back doors in their systems and so on and so forth. One very big danger that we've, all of us are sort of afraid of is governments which have all of these powers using them for tyranny. And that's absolutely true. Artificial intelligence and uh, modern large scale sort of bulk surveillance has made it possible for tyranny to exist on a scale it did not before. And perhaps no other country exemplifies that as much as China does, right? Um, if, if you, you watch, watch Minority, Minority Report, Report, guess, guess what? what? They're, They're doing, doing it, right? They have something called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform, and the police have an app, basically, which tells them, you know, go arrest this person. And these apps are ridiculous, right? We've seen some of the data that goes into it, and you can get arrested for things like growing a beard, um, having the wrong kind of book in your house, uh, working out too much, possessing evil things such as dumbbells. Um, they even have, I think the funniest one was... Um, something to do with eating at a Turkish restaurant too often or something like that, right? Like, it's completely ridiculous. And the problem is that when it's a human being, it's very easy to point at that human being and, be, and say that, you know, you are racist. You're, you're, you're just, you know, imposing Han Chinese imperialism on everyone and you just hate all the Muslims and that's why you're doing it. Now they're going to, oh, I'm not racist. The machine told me right and that's incredibly incredibly dangerous and what, what i want, want to emphasize here is i mean I'm, I'm sure all of you are afraid are afraid of and aware of what's happening in xinjiang and um the kinds of techniques this kind of bulk surveillance that china is using the becoming family the strike hard against violent terrorism campaign by the way those of you who don't know the becoming family campaign it's hilarious you know uh, the Chinese uh, government has its caterers who, uh, caterers who go into your house and they become your family. Uh, you know, 
every house, I think, has a minimum mandate of five days every two months. They live in your house. They talk to you. They talk to your children. They teach them patriotic songs and stuff like that. They really become your family and occasionally report on you and send you to internment camps. But, you know, that sort of thing. And what I really want to emphasize here, and, and this is the second place where I'm going to read out everything on the screen, is, you know, we've been talking about, there's been some discussion about Arogya Setu in India. Um, and please, 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 I'm not making a comparison directly between these two things, right? But what I do want to bring up, that what a lot of people don't perhaps know or understand, and maybe, you know, I'm speaking to a more enlightened audience here probably, but nevertheless, I'll say it. Um, the way the Chinese government has framed its... What, what I can only term a cultural genocide against the Uyghurs is medicine, right? They're using epidemiology. You know how when, when you give people a vaccine, you need to sort of vaccinate a critical mass herd immunity. You need to vaccinate a critical mass of the people. And in order, you need to keep track of who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been vaccinated. And you, do, you need to have surveillance so that, you know, if X person has COVID, then you trace all of their contacts and find out who all the other people who have COVID are and so, so on and so, so forth. forth. Guess, Guess what? what? That exact epidemiological mass is what the Chinese government has been using uh, to persecute U Uyghurs because they are treating religion or religious thought as a virus, as a pathology, right? And they're treating it in the same way at re-education hospitals. That's what they call them, by the way. They've changed the name a bunch of times, but they call them in their own pamphlets, re-education hospitals. And they're treating it as a pathology and they're using their bulk surveillance and they're using their medical organizations to use, to, to run these uh, large scale cultural genocide attempts. It's actually very medical and tied into their surveillance infrastructure. And I'm just gonna spend five minutes just reading out these three quotes. I know it's boring, but I think it's important. These are direct quotes from pamphlet. This was from Radio Free Asia. I can send you links later. Members of the public who have been chosen for re-education have been infected by an ideological illness. They have been infected with religious extremism and violent terrorist ideology. And therefore, they must seek treatment from a hospital as an inpatient. The religious extremist ideology is a type of poisonous medicine which confuses the mind of the people. If we do not eradicate religious extremism at its roots, the violent terrorist incidents will grow and spread all over like an incurable malignant tumor. Now, the second one is about people who've been to those uh, centers, right? And here's the thing, here's the difference between a hospital and a prison. At the prison, you can exit. At a hospital, you only leave when you are better, when you're cured. There is always a risk, like depression, that the illness will manifest itself at any moment, which could cause serious harm to the public. That is why they must be admitted to a re-education hospital in time to treat and cleanse the virus from their brain and restore their normal mind. Being infected by religious extremism and violent terrorist ideology and not seeking treatment is like being infected by a disease that has not been treated in time compared to COVID, the way we're thinking about it, or like taking toxic drugs. There is no guarantee that it will not trigger and affect you in the future. Having gone through re-education and recovered from the ideological disease doesn't mean that one is permanently cured. Think about how dangerous that line is. So, after completing the, completing the re-education process in the hospital and returning home, they must remain vigilant, empower themselves with the correct knowledge, strengthen their ideological studies, and actively attend various public activities to bolster their immune system. I'm just not going to talk about any, anything else on the slide. It's just going to just make me depressed. Now, I said this in a way that really focused on China. What well, I want to tell you now that this is not just China, right? This is a lot of different places. Um, going to talk about the U.S. Guess what? Same stuff's happening there. In a different way, not at that scale, nothing of this sort. But this kind of idea of using technology um, 
to decide things about the lives of people is actually happening. And this is what I call the robot overlord theory or rot. And, you know, I, I've always laughed at all of those AI people who said that we're all going to lose our jobs to the AI systems, that everything's going to be done by robots. All the menial jobs are going to be done by robots. Well, we're going to sit back, relax, and, you know, drink our virgin mojitos or whatever. It's ridiculous because think, of, think about what computers are good at. Computers are good at dealing with large amounts of information and making optimization decisions. What they're not good at is doing sort of dexterous things. Computers can't juggle very well. So guess what? We're not looking at a future, in my opinion, where robots do all the menial tasks. We're looking at a future where the managers are all robots, where the middle management of companies is entirely optimization systems and all the menial tasks are done by us. Isn't that what's happening already? Like think about the way Amazon works, right? Think about the way Uber works. Think of, like all of these companies, you have people at, on the ground doing all the menial tasks and then you have a system on top that optimizes all of it, right? And it can be used for good things. You know, Microsoft come up with this great thing in the US where it's looking at re-hospitalizations. So when you let people go from a hospital, they sometimes fall sick again and they die or they have to be readmitted and cost a lot of money. So instead they have an AI system, a neural network that says, hey, you know, maybe don't let this guy out or, you know, right now, uh, you know, because I've looked at 3,000 other cases and, you know, there's a bigger chance of a complication. So just keep them around for two more days. And it saved billions upon billions of dollars for many, many hospitals across the US. Now, apply the same idea to bail systems or uh, how long to keep someone in prison, right? Or sentencing in general. And uh, I, I want to look at sort of two people on your screen. The person on the left is this guy called Bernard Parker. The, the person on the right is Dylan Fugit. And uh, there are various systems across the US. The one in New York is called Compass. Uh, I have it written down here. Correctional of offender profiling for alternative sanctions. Isn't that such a, such a nice name? Um, and uh, yeah, you know what I'm going for. Like the black guy got tagged as high risk, the white guy got tagged as low risk, and turns out the white guy was a much more dangerous offender, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it happens on a large scale, right? I want to tell you one particular story. This is from a ProPublica investigation. I'll give you the link later. Um, there's a girl called uh, Brisha. 18 year old, she and another friend, they saw a bike, a small, you know, pink cycle bicycle on the street, and they, they were like, oh, let's just ride it down the street. And they rode it down the street, and a child sort of shouted, hey, that's my bike. And they left it and walked away. Neighbor had called the police. Uh, they got charged, right? And it's on their records, you know, they were caught stealing. And um, for bike theft. On the other hand, very similar case. Uh, another dude called Vernon Prater for shoplifting. He went on to reoffend. He's in prison for eight years right now or something. What's amazing is the, the, the system tagged the 18 year old girl as a much more dangerous offender than the 41 year old repeat offender. And we've seen this happening again and again and again. Why? It's very simple because the data you're feeding into the system in the first place is super duper biased, especially against racial minorities. And second, these systems ain't very good either, right? They, they make all sorts of mistakes. You can see that in IBM sort of uh, what diagnostic system as well, which sort of give sort of suggested wrong treatments for cancer patients and all of that stuff. And I want to emphasize this. This is not just China. This is everywhere. Everywhere where there is something to be optimized, people are trying to use computers and AI to optimize it because there's always someone who falls for the buzzwords. All right. I just put this cartoon there because I love it. Um, given all of this stuff that's happening, I think we all need to really stand up and sort of attack this false trade-off, right, of security versus privacy. I mean, this false trade-off is exactly what is being shown here. Um, because once they take away our privacy, profiling becomes commonplace, bulk surveillance becomes commonplace, and we've seen the repercussions of that. That's what we've been discussing all of this day. But as I said, the governments often have very good reasons for wanting these things. They have good motivations in many cases. And they sell us on this cartoon. They say that, look, 
you need the security. That's why we need to take away your privacy, right? And I want to push back against this idea, right? In my opinion, the biggest change that, let's say, happened after 9-11 in terms of security was locking cockpit doors, which did not have that much of a repercussion on one's price, right? And that's what many, many security experts repeat, um, so in my opinion. But I, I want to push back against this fake trade-off here. And um, sorry for the math, I won't stay here for very long, but I want to push the idea that modern cryptography actually solves many of these problems. So old crypto is stuff like passwords or what most of us think of as encryption, locking something in a box. I have a piece of information, I want to keep it safe, I lock it in a box with a password and boom, it is now safe. Um, modern crypto isn't like that because it says that, wait, you need to take that information out of that box in order to use it. What's the point of the info if you can't use it? And the moment you take it out of the box, it's unsafe, right? And many a time, it's not just the information actually needs to flow through multiple people in order to get an outcome that we want. We want to process that information along with information from other sources in order to get some data out of it. Let's say uh, I want to find out how to get from point A to point B. And Google has its mapping and traffic tool. And now I need to give, tell Google, I want to get from A to B. And I tell Google what A and B are. And then Google uses its mapping stuff to tell me how to get from A to B. Right? So Google data, my data, and together we have something of value. Um, that's how most stuff is done nowadays. How does just having passwords help in that case? Because Google's going to get my data anyway. It turns out modern cryptography can solve it, and I'm and I'm, and I'm going to try to try to quickly in five minutes. I'm already over time. Uh, walk you through just two simple examples. The first, let's use. The, don't worry about the math on this slide. I just lifted it from a paper, uh, from one of my old papers. Um, let's imagine we want to compute our average salary, right? There's a bunch of people in this room, and I, I all of us want to compute our average salary. Problem is, I'm, everyone's kind of afraid maybe my salary is below average, I don't want to see it. How do, how do we go about doing it? Now, usually what the government will say is that the government comes in, they, you, everyone tells the government their salary, government's a trusted third party, and the government tells everyone the average salary. Um, and that's the usual way we did it. The only thing encryption managed to do was the communication between me and the government was secure. Right? That's what encryption did. Think about the following trick. I take out a calculator, I add, I, I put in my salary, I add a big random number to it, my random number, nobody else knows it. I hand it to you, you take the calculator, you add your salary, you add another random number to it, you pass it to the person next to you, that person adds their salary, adds a big random number, negative, positive, whatever. Goes around the table, comes back to me. What I do is I, I just subtract off that random number my big random number. You do the same, the next person does the same, and at the end of two rounds, everyone has subtracted off the random number. What remains is the sum of everyone's salaries, and now you can just divide by n, the number of people, and now you have the average. Now it turns out that if you can do this for multiplication and for addition, and we can do it as it turns out, um, it's a little bit more complicated, but we can do it, you can compute any function. Arbitrary function, anything that can be computed, can be computed in this way. And just think about what that means. I can compute an arbitrary function on private data. Just like your salary never gets leaked in this calculator protocol, right? So my secret is my salary, your secret is your salary, it never gets leaked. Similarly, okay, it never gets leaked beyond the outcome of the thing. Right? So if I have auxiliary data that everyone's salary is 12 rupees, then just knowing the average mathematically tells me what your salary is. But that would have been the case even if we had the trusted third party, the government, in. So we're saying it is equivalently secure to a trusted third party. Right? Um, now, think about the Google example I gave you. This tells me, and we can actually do this, I'll show you a slide, where I never tell Google what A and B are, but Google can still tell me how to get from A to B. Think about how counterintuitive that is. How can Google tell me how to get from A to B if I don't tell Google Maps what A and B are? 
And it turns out modern cryptography can do exactly that. So I want to completely break this tra trade off, this fake balance that people are putting forth between security and usability. And I want to say, no, we can use stuff without decrypting, without breaking privacy. All right. The second is about uh, decision making. So the first part was about keeping data safe. The second is about uh, decentralized decision making. People have talked about blockchains and all of that stuff in many other talks. I want to talk about something simpler, right? Let's say you want to have a legal system where, you know, four judges have to sign off on something before something happens, a system, a secret gets released or something gets decrypted, or you have a board with 15 members and any six out of those 15 need to agree to something before it happens. Now you could do it in a stupid way. You have secret password and you just break it up into multiple parts and okay, but that's not very secure, right? Any one of them drops out, you're dead. I want to give you a very quick class six geometry flashback. You remember that theory about a line, y equals mx plus c and about how you need two points to make a line? Okay, here's what we do. We draw a line and the place where it cuts the y axis that that bit right there this 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 distance let's say that's your password that integer is your password that's your secret now i can take 50 different points on that line and give it to 50 different people any one of them they can't recover this secret password distance any two of them can because with two points you can reconstruct a line and now you can generalize three for a parabola basically you just get a, a curve of the right order and you know you take as many points on that curve, distribute it, and whatever is the number of points required to solve that curve can come together and recreate that exact same thing. So not only can we impose um, processing without breaking privacy, we can even have decision making that is distributed and private and secure. Right? These things exist, and they are very, very well understood. This was the app that I was talking about. A friend of mine named Ben Moon and myself built this for uh, a project for IARPA uh, a few years ago um, in the US. And this basically does, what it does is it tells you if um, a friend of yours is near you or something. And this has many other applications. You, know, you don't want your spy satellites to come close to, to each other, but you don't necessarily want to be broadcasting your location. So this is a privacy preserving way of checking if another user is very near you or not, and that's it. You never reveal your location, same way as you would never reveal your salary, and so on and so forth. And these systems exist. What I want to end with is a quick discussion about uh, this COVID stuff. And this is, I, I want to thank Nikki Case. This is from NCase, so it's me. And what I want to say is you don't need a centralized government stuff to keep track of all of your data. Again, this is my pushback against that. I'm saying current technology can solve this without breaking privacy. All of that balance about, oh, we need this information to keep you safe, that's garbage. So let me just talk you through this funny little cartoon. Here's what they're doing. You have your phone, let's say you're Alice, I'm Bob. You have your phone and your phone just spouts out random numbers. And my phone also spouts out random numbers every few minutes. There's no central repository or anything in them yet. And then when our phones are close to each other, they exchange these messages. And all phones do is they remember all the messages they've sent and all the messages they've received in the past 14 days. That's all they do. Pretty easy. It's about the size size of a mid-sized video. Now, let's say you get COVID for whatever reason. You, you turn up at your hospital, and now your messages, just those random numbers, are posted on some public board. And all my phone has to do is regularly go to that public board and check if any of my messages match any of the messages on that public board. And there is no more exchange of information. There's no central government system that needs to know anything about anything. It's that simple. Now. This is a fairly inefficient protocol, actually. Even though it seems quite efficient, it's, it's perfectly doable. There are even better protocols that exist. This is just the one that I could, that Nikki Case could explain in a simple cartoon with six slides, basically. There are many, many good ways that do exist and that do solve our problems. So the technology is there. What we need 
is civic movements. What we need is lawyers. What we need is a shared understanding of how to solve not just today's problems, not just solve Arogya Setu or current apps, but all the stuff that's going to happen in the future. And those are the kinds of long-term interventions that I'm really interested in. All right? That's it from me for today. Uh, let me take a look at the questions. All right. In my opinion, what is stopping Indian technology folks in academia to speak up really stupid technical decisions made by different departments of governments? Well, two things. First of all, um, I want to slightly disagree with that question. Lots of people really do speak up. It's just most people don't care. I mean, I had a conversation with a friend who was pretty high up in Oracle not too long ago. And uh, he just out and told me that nobody wants security. The clients don't want security. The people using the software that clients made don't want security or privacy. So it's, it's, it's really hard to uh, convince people to do that because you got to understand, it's, it's not about security or privacy. It's about how do you convince an organization to spend X dollars of their money or X rupees of their money on implementing secure and private technologies when they could spend that money doing something else, when there isn't even a good way of measuring the impact of that security or privacy, right? We have very good risk assessment systems in place for many other things. Like if I put in X rupees into marketing, we, we know ways, like marketing experts, even if they're lying to you, they'll tell you that, oh, you know, we're bringing in this much money, right? The security people, we, we don't have that yet. We can't say that, you know, you're at, you're at an 8.5, and if you get from an 8.5 to 9, these are the good things that will happen. So we need more regulation. We need more thought. There, there's a lot of stuff. Probably, you know, there needs to be some sort of government regulated scoring system that then insurance companies buy into. So uh, companies that can just the same way, you know, if your warehouse catches fire, you have insurance as long as you report it to the police and so on. So, you know, if you get hacked, you, need, you can now have cyber insurance. And maybe your cyber insurance costs you more money if you don't have high cyber security. So if your cybersecurity government rating is lower, then your cyber insurance costs you more. Maybe your premium is more, premiums are more and so on and so forth. We, we need a whole umbrella of things just, so, just like everything else. And we need to treat cybersecurity like any other kind of risk. That's the best way to make C-suite individuals understand what's going on. It's just like anything else. Because otherwise, you know, your average CTO or CEO has no idea what to do when, you know, Paul from IT turns up and says, you know, 10,000 of our customers have had their details leaked on the dark web. And it's like, wow, what do I do? Do I release it? Do I not release it? Like, uh, do I need outside counsel? Like, they don't know. They have no idea, right? Because there's no protocol for it. So that we need to build these protocols beforehand. Then I, I've seen cases where the police come to you, the FBI or whoever else, they come to you and they say, okay, just like if your warehouse is burned down due to arson, we want all the video camera footage. And similarly, in the case of an internet hack, they say, I want all of the details of, of the IP addresses that logged in. And then the company suddenly says, and their lawyers say that, hold on, you know, this is private data. Our shareholders will throw a fit if we share this. We can't share it with you. And then the police have to go and get a separate warrant so that they can get the information in order to solve the crime of that was perpetrated against that company itself. So we need sort of pre-built contract so that the company knows whom to go to. They know what information they can safely transfer to the police. They, there have to be pre-built ideas about what kind of anonymization to use. All of that stuff needs to happen, right? And, and there needs to be sort of standardizations about this stuff because many co companies don't release data because they're afraid it'll hit their shareholder value, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, when talking about surveillance, most people reply, Google knows more about me, so why can't government? So two things. First of all, Google shouldn't know about you either. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea, right? Um, and also, the government can do a lot more bad things than Google can, right? The government has guns. How about that, right? Um, and in general, there are various opposing forces. So let me put it this way. If Google goes back, your government can try to protect you. If your government goes back, Google can't protect you. It's that simple. Right? 
Um, why do organizations not inform users and acknowledge breaches when a significant cohort is affected by the same? Is it only about goodwill? So first of all, they kind of do. Like I remember when there was this Equifax breach in the US and my credit stuff got leaked. This is hilarious. Like that's when I learned how much data they had about me, right? And they do, but there, there's sort of two confounding factors there. Confounding factor one, uh, this is from the Verizon's yearly survey on the stuff that comes out each year. And uh, I was going to ask take a wild guess, but I realized I have no way of taking input here. Um, it turns out it takes a long time for organizations to even detect that they've been hacked, right? For sort of top quality Fortune 500 ish sort of high quality institutions around the world. The average, the, the, not the average, the median time to detecting that they were infiltrated and someone was stealing data from them um, was around, was nearly 90 days. It was like 88 days or something, right? So it takes a long time for them to even realize what was going on. And when that has happened, it's also not always clear what kind of threat actor was acting against them. Like, was it another government? Was it just some dude off of the internet who's like selling that data? Just in the past few days, so you know, banks have been breached, um, credit organizations. I mean, if you just look back over the past decade, you know, Ashley Madison, that Canadian extramarital affairs website was breached. JP Morgan Chase has been breached. The US uh, F-35 Lightning Mark II aircraft, the various details of that were breached, not through the US, it was via an Australian intermediary. So it's like, if these companies, and like the US SF-86, the security form 86, which is what you fill in if you want to get a security clearance in the US, um, that was brief. If, if people can't protect their own military secrets, what makes you think they can protect your stuff? So in addition to thinking about the government having your data and why shouldn't they, also, I, I think it's very important to start treating these people as a bunch of nincompoops half the time. Like there's some clever, clever people in there, but a lot of them are not any cleverer than the average person in the average government office, right? Again, like I said, not the brightest crayons in the box. Does running an Onion uh, service make you visible on the dark web? Uh, I don't want to talk about Onion in too much detail right now. Um, I'm, but I'm also not sure what you mean visible on the dark web. Like, are people going to notice you and attack you? Not really. Um, you're, you're mostly fine along this, that sort of thing. I do recommend everyone tries out Tor. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, I'm told that was the last question. So uh, that's it from me for today. I, I hope uh, you had a good time and I didn't bore you too much. And uh, I'll send out all of these, a bunch of these citations and links separately. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm hoping the IFF folks will make that public as well. So uh, if you want to ask me more questions about that, feel free to email. All right, that's it from me for today. Thank you so much, Professor Gupta. I think I've not had the pleasure to attend a talk which was so accessible, but also so rigorous at the same time in a while. And just thank you again for taking time out on a holiday to do this. As Professor Gupta has already suggested, we will be sharing a lot of the papers, case studies, comments that he mentioned on the Internet Freedom Forum, where you can engage in maybe a longer conversation with him on some of these issues. And if you found this event thought-provoking and informative, and if you would like us to continue hosting more such events, do consider supporting our work by becoming, by becoming an IFS member. You can do this by visiting internetfreedom.in slash donate. Thank you once again for joining us today. Thanks for having me.